words. The Glendale Road Church of Christ proudly presents a weekly exploration of the Word of our living God. This is It Is Written with Minister Stephen Hunter. Most of us are familiar with the Bible story of Zacchaeus. Uh, we're familiar with it mainly because of a children's song that many of us have committed to heart that I'll not lead you in right now. But we know that Zacchaeus, as the Bible says, was small of stature, or as the song says, Zacchaeus was a wee little man. One can only conclude that it must have been a Scotsman that wrote those lyrics. But Zacchaeus, as Jesus came into the town where he was, Zacchaeus wanted to get close to Jesus. But because he was of a small stature, he couldn't do it because there was a a great crowd that had gathered around Christ. And then he found a tree and he climbed up in the tree and wanting just to see a glimpse of him. And ultimately what Jesus did was he invited Zacchaeus down and he said, I'm going to have a meal at your house. And I think the, the whole, one of the thrusts of that story in our Bibles is Man longs to get as close to God as humanly possible. And it was only after the flood in Genesis that we read that man, Noah, built an altar. That's the first mention of an altar having been built to God. And sacrifices having to be made so that man could somehow approach God in some way. Ultimately, when Jesus gave His own life... He became the medium through which we can approach God. And the Hebrew writer says that we can approach His throne of mercy and grace with boldness because of what Jesus has done. But looking to the idea of man trying to approach God, in the Old Testament leading up even up into parts of the New, we had to do that through an intermediary. And the intermediary by which we could approach God was the priesthood of Israel. And so we look in our Old Testaments and we notice that the very first high priest was Aaron, and his sons Nadab and Abihu came after him. Moses was commissioned to make a certain mixture of anointing oil, and you can read about the mixture he used in Exodus 30, verses 22 through 33. But as the time came, Moses took the anointing oil, and he poured some of the anointing oil on Aaron's head and anointed him to consecrate him. And he would later go on and he would do this to Aaron's two sons, Nadab and Abihu as well. So here they are being set apart for a specific role. Aaron being the first high priest and all high priests after him were to have come from the lineage of Aaron who was of the tribe of Levi. But even the high priest had certain restrictions placed upon him, one of them being that he could not openly mourn The high priest wasn't to uncover his head nor tear his clothes, which were in the ancient East, gestures of mourning. He wasn't to go near a dead body. He wasn't to defile himself, even for the sake of his mother and father. So if his very own parents passed away, he couldn't go near them, nor could he go near just any dead body because he would defile himself. And he wasn't to go out of the sanctuary nor profane the sanctuary of God. So the high priest had a tall task. It was a life, obviously, of isolation. It was a life of uh, being ostracized. But the whole purpose of his being isolated from so much and ostracized from so much was so that he could minister faithfully to God. And you look at the task that he had before him, and you can read about it at length in Leviticus and, and also Deuteronomy and other passages, and you see that he had a tall order to fill. And so it must have been a lonely life at times, spending most of his time there in the tabernacle and then later the temple when it came along and not even being able to mourn, not even being able to uh, do a lot of things that just about everybody else could do. But he also was only able to go into the most holy place one time a year. Now God had given Moses in the book of Exodus this perfect blueprint as to how Moses should build the tabernacle, the types of drapery that should adorn it, the furniture that should be centered in it. And within this most central part of the tabernacle, there was this place called the Holy of Holies. And we see this also in the temple later on when the temple was built. In the Holy of Holies, there were these huge statues of angelic creatures called cherubim. 
and they faced towards the entrance to the Holy of Holies in the temple. And then you had in the center there, you had what's called the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant was a very special and holy, if you will, chest, is, is how we could think of it. And, and inside it, it contained three things. The first of which were the two tablets of the Ten Commandments. And that represented God's covenant and His law with His people. Secondly, there was a jar of manna placed in the Ark of the Covenant that represented God's provision for His people while they wandered in the wilderness. The third item placed in the Ark of the Covenant was the bud of Aaron's staff to show that Aaron and his descendants were chosen as priests to God. Now, before the high priest could go into the Holy of Holies, which he was only allowed to do one day a year. By the way, if you look on your calendars, you, you might notice some of you at a certain time of the year, there's uh, this little Hebrew word. It says Rosh Hashanah which in English is translated Day of Atonement. Now, if you were to drive down Nashville on West End Avenue, there are about three or four synagogues on West End Avenue alone, and if you were to drive down there during the High Holy Day, specifically Rosh Hashanah, one of the things you would see is you would see the, uh, a lot of the Jewish people of that community walking to synagogue. Uh, some of them believe it's a sin to labor on such a holy day, and they think starting your car because it ignites a fire is as much as laboring. So they'll walk to synagogue. But it's a very special day. And on that one day that comes every year, before the high priest could go in and make atonement for the sins of the nation, he had to first make atonement for his own sins. So he would offer various sacrifices for himself. He would bathe himself. He would put on special garments because God told him that when he went into there, he was going before the very presence of God and that God's presence would appear as a cloud over the Ark of the Covenant. Now, the top that covered the Ark of the Covenant, that chest, was called the mercy seat. And God would sit there at the mercy seat. And there He would meet with His high priest and the high priest would make sacrifice. Leviticus 16, you can read about this at length, but anyway, just one particular verse, verse 14, the high priest was to take some of the blood of the bull and sprinkle it with his finger on the mercy seat on the east side, and before the mercy seat he shall sprinkle some of the blood with his finger seven times. Then he shall kill the goat of the sin offering. I want you to keep this idea of the mercy seat in your mind because it's going to become very important. But from the time that God instituted this order with His people of old Israel, this happened day in and day out, year after year, for hundreds of years, and even up until the late first century. But when Jesus came, He came to be our high priest. And as was read in Psalm 110, the prophecy of the psalm was He would be a priest forever, after the order of Melchizedek, which means righteous king. Melchizedek was both a king and a priest. And you can read about Melchizedek in the book of Genesis where Abraham goes and he makes an offering to the Lord through Melchizedek, the high priest. But we see that in Hebrews of Christ's high priesthood, Jesus is a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle which the Lord erected and not man. So there on earth, man had erected the tabernacle that God had gave him the instructions to erect. Same thing with the temple. These were built with human hands, but Jesus doesn't go into the temple or the tabernacle that was on earth and minister, but rather He is in the actual tabernacle, which is in heaven, that God Himself made. And He is a minister there of the true tabernacle. Just as a point of interest, if you would care to know, the term here, translated minister in Hebrews 8.2, is literally liturgist. We hear of some who describe their worship as liturgy, and uh, that's, that's uh, the word that's used there in the original. But Jesus there, He mediates a better covenant than the old one. One of the points that the Hebrew writer makes, that if Christ were on earth, he could not be a priest. 
Because the priests who offer the gifts according to the law, note this in your Bible, they serve the copy and shadow of the heavenly things as Moses was divinely instructed when he was about to make the tabernacle. Now that's very important. What they did here on earth, they did only copying the shadow of what truly existed in heaven. But Jesus doesn't serve the copy and the shadow, but He serves the actual thing. And so Jesus, our high priest, is there before God making intercession for us. And so His excellent ministry, which is called a much more excellent ministry, is so because Jesus Christ is the mediator of a better covenant that is built on better promises. The old covenant was one where we could never fully receive forgiveness of sins. And so day after day, year after year, sacrifices would be offered. And they would be offered unendingly simply because the requirements of God's holiness could never be met through the blood of bulls and goats. But when Jesus offered Himself, He became that once-for-all sacrifice so that there isn't the need to continuing offering sacrifices. And the new covenant that He mediates is the new covenant, part of which we observed a moment ago, that is the covenant of His blood. And when on the Passover, Jesus gave us the new meaning for the Lord's Supper, the Holy Communion. He said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. Now here's what's interesting. The priests after Aaron had to offer sacrifices for their own sins, but Jesus, the Hebrew writer points out, was tempted in like manner such as we, yet without sin. But what I find very interesting is that Jesus was both the offerer and the offering of the sins of all humanity. I just think that's, I can tell you're as impressed as I am by that. Amen, okay, thank you. He is the offerer and the offering. And you think about that and you go, wow, that's pretty neat. Because these other priests who were consecrated, who were set apart for this task, they had to make atonement for their own sins. But Jesus doesn't go to God and say, well, I need to atone for my sins, but rather He says, I am the atonement and I offer myself. Not for my sins, for the sins of the world. A little deep, but it's very, 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 very interesting. Now, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 7, is a very interesting passage as well, I think. In all things, He had to be made like His brethren, that is Jesus, that He might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. Now, this is alluding to the doctrine that uh, we, ref we could refer to as the Incarnation. You read in Philippians chapter 2 that Jesus, who existed in the very form of God, didn't consider it robbery to be counted equal with God, but made Himself of nothing, emptying Himself and taking on the form of a servant, a bond servant, that is. And so picture this if you can. A, a, a lot of times mental pictures help me really put things together. Picture for a moment that you have Jesus Christ our Lord there in heaven. And there He is in all His glory and all His splendor. Now, we have read of some of the passages of the Old Testament, the glory and the splendor of God. For example, Isaiah chapter 6 comes to mind immediately. And there in Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah said, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. And the train of His robe filled the whole temple. This is the depiction of a king sitting upon His throne. And He said there were these angels surrounding Him, these seraphim, these fiery angels. And they had six wings. With two they covered His feet, with two they flew, with two they covered His face. And as they're doing this, these fiery angels are crying out to one another, in an antiphonal sound, uh, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. And so we got an idea of the depiction of God in His glory and splendor. And so picture Jesus there in heaven in His glory and splendor. And then at an appointed time, 
it's decided, now you have to go. And so Jesus, being the Lord of lords, the King of kings, takes His crown off His head. He places it down there to His side. Perhaps an angel comes to attend Him and they unclasp His royal robe and take it off Him. He exits His throne and He steps down. He divests Himself of all the rights and privileges and honors of being Christ. And He does that so that by the operation of the Holy Spirit, He can grow in the womb of a young Jewess whom God has chosen. And so He becomes something that He's never been before. He takes on something that He's never had before. Flesh. And so He's born as an infant. He grows and He learns just like everybody else. And then as John the Baptist arises and begins preaching and preparing for the kingdom of God, he recognizes immediately this is the forerunner who's to pave my way. And so he goes to him. And he doesn't say, John, I'm here. You just step aside. He says, John, baptize me. And John says, now wait a second. If anything, I need to be baptized by you. But he says, no, this has to happen so that we can fulfill all, I can fulfill all righteousness. And so there he is immersed in the river Jordan and the Holy Spirit descends as a dove upon him and the voice from heaven says, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. And immediately after Jesus for 40 days and 40 nights, he doesn't eat anything, he doesn't drink anything, but he's in the wilderness and there is the adversary, the devil tempting him. Maybe the devil is thinking, you know, when you're sitting on your throne up in heaven, you have authority and power and majesty. But here on earth, this is my playground. You've stepped into the lion's den. Isn't that what Peter says? For the devil walks about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And so there Satan is looking at the Christ and he's going, you're hungry, aren't you? You've never experienced this before. You've never understood what it is to be hungry because you've never needed sustenance. But this physical body that you've voluntarily taken upon yourself, now you understand what it is to be hungry. So you see this stone and all these other stones over here, command them to become bread and just go ahead and eat. Jesus says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. He's emaciated, he's hungry, he's starving. Jesus says, I understand why people get hangry now. I got to, you know, maybe he gets this. Then Satan says, okay, come here, let me show you something. And so they go up and he shows him all the kingdoms of the world. He said, it'd be, it'd be nice to be back in control, wouldn't it? When you were in heaven, you had all the glory and the majesty. You called the shots. You were worshipped. But now no one really pays you any mind. But all these kingdoms, if, if, if you'll just bow down and worship me, I'll give them all to you. This is my domain. God has given this into my hands. And Jesus replies, you shall worship the Lord your God only and Him only shall you serve. And so then Satan says, okay, let's go up to the pinnacle of the temple. He says, end your suffering. Throw yourself down. After all, the Bible says, see, even Satan knows Scripture. The Bible says that he'll give his angels charge over you lest you dash your foot against a stone. Jesus says, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. Now, I reversed the order on the last two, mistakenly. 
But you get the point. And so God is telling us that Christ had to be made like His brethren. Who are His brethren? If you back up earlier in Hebrews chapter 2, His brethren are people, Israelites, Christians. Isn't that a nice thought? I mean, when you think of the many ways that Jesus could refer to us, two ways that pop to mind immediately, from the Gospel according to John, friend. He calls us His friends. Greater love had none than this, that a man would lay down his life for his friends. And He calls us His brethren. And in Hebrews chapter 2 earlier, He says, I will proclaim your name before the assembly of my brethren. God says He had to be made like His brethren that He could be made a merciful and faithful high priest to make propitiation for our sins. Now that's one of those fancy church words. Propitiation, oh my, what does that mean? Well, I want to get to it in a second, but let me show you a couple of other verses that contain it. First of all, in Romans chapter 3, God set Jesus forth as a propitiation by His blood through faith to demonstrate His righteousness. In 1 John 2, 2, Jesus Christ is the propitiation of our sins, not for ours only, but also for the whole world. This term translated propitiation in the New Testament is used just a handful of times. And the Greek term, not that you care, is hilasterion. And whenever this word... Hilasterion is translated in the Greek Old Testament. The translation that's given is mercy seat. So in the place of propitiation, you could write mercy seat. Remember I told you a second ago that the mercy seat is where man met God through the high priest. The mercy seat is where sacrifice is made and sins are atoned for. Not only is Christ's blood that which is offered upon the mercy seat in the heavenly tabernacle, but Jesus Christ Himself is the mercy seat upon which God receives atonement for our sins. And so bringing this all together, Jesus is where we meet God. There is no other name under heaven by which men are saved, Except the name of Jesus Christ. Our Lord Himself said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. We cannot get to God without going through Him. And so what this spells for us as Christians is that we are living stones, as living stones are being built up into a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, His own special people. Brethren, according to this passage, we're not Americans, we're Christians. Though we may be Americans. We are a holy nation. You don't need anybody specially set aside to worship God for you because you, Christians, are priests and priestesses. And we see this also reflected in the revelation of John. He has made us kings and priests to His God and Father and have made us kings and priests to our God and we shall reign on earth. Therefore, we are collectively God's priests to the world, but also individually. The priest's duty was to serve as a mediator between man and God an intermediary, rather, between man and God. Jesus Christ is our only mediator. And so if we serve that same priestly function today as Christians, the primary aim of our priesthood is bringing the lost to Christ. Ministering the Gospel. Just as Aaron was consecrated with the holy anointing oil and was initiated into being the first high priest, The initiation into the specialty of being a priest of God, a Christian, is faith in Christ Jesus the Lord. The oath that we take is the confession that we make that Christ is God's only Son, and we are then consecrated by the waters of baptism by having our sins washed away. And so this morning we invite you to join the holy priesthood, the royal priesthood, this holy nation of Christians.
Come to the front as we stand and as we sing. This has been It Is Written, presented by the Glendale Road Church of Christ. We welcome your visits and communications at any time. With God's own heart, oh, let the ancient words impart.